This week, we have an amazing interview that I have been holding on to for, I think, like nine months, maybe maybe eight. Paul, I am so sorry. This was an interview with Dr. Paul Etchison that was so good, but I didn't want to release it yet because I wanted to save it for this season on leadership and change, communication, and he has so much good content. He has his own podcast called The Dental Heroes Podcast. We'll talk about that in the show a little bit. Um, a, a, amazing person. We've now met in person multiple times, and I really, really like Dr. Paul Etchison. You're, you're going to get to like him. By the end of this episode, you're like, man, I, I would work for that guy. Like, y- You just get this sense of like, he cares about people, he cares about leadership, and he's built from scratch a multi-doc practice. And that's a longer journey. So we get to kind of hear the the, the timeline of all this for him. Um, so once again, I'm sorry. I know, I know he's been anxious for our episode on our show to come out. He released ours forever ago. Here we go with Dr. Paul Etchison. But first, a word from our sponsor. So George, you said you just now before I hit record that you are at your one year mark of using Swell. Tell me about where you were and where you are now. We started with Swell. We had worked really hard to get 30 reviews on Google. Like from the time I bought it, they had like 80. And then when I started a year ago, we had about 100 reviews. In a year, we amassed over 200 Google reviews and we're now over like 310, I think, um, (laughs) on Google with just doing nothing. I don't know. None of my team members know it's a point of emphasis. We just use swell. Like I'm pretty big on that. So talk to me about that because I think this is one of my favorite things about how you feel about swell is the team involvement. How much team involvement is there to use swell? My team does not know what swell is. (laughs) Yeah. It's, it's not a thing. We don't talk about Google reviews. We don't care. We just see our patients and live our life and we get a ton of reviews more than anybody else. So, and how hard was it to get those reviews that you got when you, between the 80 and the hundred, you know, like, were you training your yeah. team? Were you emphasizing no, it? No, like we went, well, we went from getting five a month to getting like 20 to 25 a month. And right. all we did was switch services. We had another service that was texting people for reviews and we just switched as well. And like four times more reviews with no extra or different type of effort. Go to swellcx.com slash shared practices to get the absolute lowest price on Swell through our exclusive promo. Again, that's swellcx.com slash shared practices to start getting more reviews with Swell today. Okay, I have with me today, Dr. Paul Etchison from the Dental Practice Hero. Did I get the name right? I, I feel like I... Like there was this moment right as I was about to say Dental Practice Hero. And I'm like, is that actually the name of the podcast? It's the Dental Practice Heroes podcast. Heroes. Okay. The heroes is it's plural. Plural. Yes. plural. Well, we're the same way. We're shared practices. Uh-huh. Um, and, and like people are like share practice. And I'm like, no, <laughs> shared with the D and practices with an S. There so I, I feel your pain. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I, kind of became aware of your podcast at Voices of Dentistry because some of the people I was interviewing had had been on your show. People were recommending your show. You spoke there. And so I was like, okay, I need to reach out to Paul. And I started listening. I've been binge listening for the last few days. So your voice is in my head and I've loved it. Like it's been an amazing show and I, I'm glad I've got a new show that I can like digest for the next two weeks until I catch up. Um, so, so I want you to introduce to our listeners um, your journey, both you know, graduating dental school, practice ownership, getting into podcasting. Share with us kind of how you are the the hero of dentistry today. Yeah, absolutely. And first of all, just thank you for the compliments of Voices of Dentistry. That was a really awesome experience for me. That was the biggest audience I ever spoke in front of. Speaking is a fairly new thing for me, so that was. Really cool that I, I got some good feedback on that. Oh, you and uh, also a big fan of your podcast, man. So it's really cool to be on here. So uh, well, I just you. appreciate that. So my journey, okay, I'm, I am coming up on my 10-year uh, dental reunion coming up in May, which is just insane to me. Actually, I think wow. it's April. But uh, I've been out for 10 years. Okay. Um, from when I graduated, I went into an associateship at a pretty busy managed care, a little bit of Medicaid, just like really fast paced office where I learned how to just do things really fast. And it wasn't the best run place, like management leadership wise, but man, it was just a great experience just clinically. I just learned so much, learned how to do molar endo, learned how to do complicated extractions, place implants, uh, got my start in ortho, which is just a huge focus for me now at my practice. And it was just 
it was cool. You know, it, it wasn't a GPR, but it kind of was a GPR. I was going to say, so basically it sounds like all of the things that I really got out of my residency, you just got paid more to learn. <laughs> pretty, pretty, pretty much. So, I guess that's how it worked. Yeah. Well played. Well played. Okay, good. Yeah. So um, I just worked on getting really fast and uh, just taking a t- bunch of CE, you know, getting my skills going. And it was about maybe two years into that, that I had said, you know what, I'm opening a practice. And this was something I, I always knew I was going to own at some point, but I had went to breakaway practice seminars and it just lit a fire under me. And I'm like, I'm doing it. And I really didn't spend a lot of time looking at acquisitions. I just wanted to go startup route right off the get go. And one day we were going to a one year old birthday party, just maybe 20, maybe 15 miles from where I, where I lived at the, at the time. Okay. And there was just this little strip mall and I was just looking at it. I'm like, huh, I'm like, there's a lot of vacancy in this strip mall. And then when I looked at it on Google Maps, I'm like, wow, there is like a hub of neighborhoods around here. And all the other dentists are like maybe like two, three miles away. So it just turned out to be a really great location. So we opened up in April of 2012, coming up on seven years. And this is a suburb of Chicago? Yeah. Yeah. We're about 40 miles south of Chicago. So so I am at the transition line from south suburb to uh, farmland. So okay. you, you go a little bit south of my practice, it's just all farms. So, so the, the very edge of suburbia. Pretty much, yeah. I mean, we're maybe, gosh, I think 30 miles from the Indiana border and uh, just straight south of Chicago. So, Which, but which it, seems like in general, like not a bad place to be because that's where the growth tends to happen. Oh, yeah. I mean, in, in the past seven years, I mean, just the neighborhoods on the street of my practice, just, they, they just keep popping up and keep filling in and... It's been great. I mean, I don't know how much of my practice success I can attribute to having a great location because we did have a great location, but I, I, it's, it's just, we went bonkers from day one, man. It was just, our our biggest issue was we just grew too damn fast, which is a good problem to have. But so we, um, five op office did that for maybe three years until I brought on an associate. Then we were split shifting. That was when I went down to three days clinical. And then I, just recently expanded in October. We bought the, we got the space next door to us. We went to 11 operatories and then I added a third associate. Um, I'm sorry, a second associate, a third dentist, including myself, as well as a periodontist like slash oral surgeon. So right now we've got open chairs. They were about, I don't know, I think five months into our expansion. So we've got some open chairs because we've exp- capacity opened up so much, but it's been great, man. I mean, I'm up to 25 employees. They're all great. And I That's just have, huge. I That's have a, amazing. Dude, I have so much fun with these girls at work and we hang out a lot, like outside the practice. I don't get to hang out with them as much as they get together and hang out, right. but it's just a great family culture and it's just really fun to be at work. And, and there's just so much laughter and so it, it, it's a good culture at the practice. So I, I just want to focus in on a few, a few moments here. So what was the moment that like, you brought on that first associate. Like, when did you realize that you were ready for that? So I realized I was ready and it was kind of, I went through a, a, maybe a dark period, I would say, where we were just so at capacity that it was just patients were just pissed off because they couldn't get in <laughs> to see us. And I was doing four days a week and it was like, it was torture. I mean, I used to tell, I tell my wife, like I saw so on Mondays, I always work one to nine. I've just always done that since graduating. So you, you wake up about eight o'clock and then you got five hours before you go to work. And I was just in such a crappy mood. And she'd be like, what's wrong? I'm like, I just, I know I'm going to go to work and just get literally emotionally abused for eight hours mm-hmm. straight. And, and that's what it was like, man. We, we tried to squeeze everybody in. We didn't have enough chairs for people. We, we couldn't make everybody happy. And we started pulling off insurances, but it just never really let up. So I kind of just set the date and I never wanted an associate. I said, no, I'm not doing an associate. I'm going to go fee for service. I'm, I'm going to have a boutique practice with really high fees. That's going to be my game. And I just set a date like for six months. And I said, I'm getting an associate and I'm going down to three days. And everyone I knew was like, dude, you're, you're like 33 years old. Are you crazy? Like, you can't. <laughs> and I'm like, no, I'm going to work three days. I don't want to work that much anymore. So, and it was more that I was just super burnt out. And I, I put out an ad and not a lot of people want to come down here in the South suburbs because it's so far from Chicago. They think it's just like literally in the boonies. Right. But I found a great associate from 
Someone I wanted to hire ended up not wanting it because I was only offering three days, but it was a friend of hers and it just kind of serendipitously worked out and she, she's still there and she's great, man. I, I, I hear these horror stories about uh, associates and she's awesome. I mean, she's a good producer. She's good with the patients. Me and her get along really well. And she was uh, three days for a good, maybe about a year, a little over a year. And then she quit her other job and we, we brought her on five days and then I stayed at three days. Okay. But, yeah. And, and how has that been like having you have three clinical days do you then have like a business day like how do you balance the rest of your time you can do whatever the heck you want with it but how much of it is still spent kind of running the practice and leading the practice right right so my my three clinical days i think were 778 seven, so they uh what's 22 hours a week of clinical so 22 hours a week and then i would on thursdays maybe about 4 or 5 hours you know of you know, being in the practice, talking to people, leading, and then, you know, how it is. I mean, running your own practice, you do a lot of things at home. You're always working on writing up systems. I'm making training videos, you know, always staying busy. But I would say the people stuff, the management, four hours a week. And this is what I'm telling you. I think if I logged it in, it might even be less. Because, I mean, in the summertime, it wasn't so much. In the wintertime, it was a lot more. Right. But that was something I had to learn, like, the hard way. And I, I talked about this on other podcasts, is that, when I first went to three days, I'm like, sweet, I'm checking out Wednesday and I'll see you guys Monday. You know, I'm, I'm going golfing and drinking with my friends and stuff. And it, it didn't go so well. Like the huh. system started going bad, you know, ball started dropping on patients, upset patients. And then I, I just kind of realized, man, I got to actually run the practice. And it's, there's something to be said about that. And as we've grown now being 25 employees, I just three weeks ago, I went down to two days clinical because I just couldn't do the amount of training with my team and spend the time like leading and training my new team members. Cause I added up quite a few employees as we expanded is I wanted to. And, and that was the stuff that just really got me fired up. Like, you know, I'm, I'm going to go in there and we're going to talk to people. We're going to, we're going to come up with some systems. We're going to talk about how things are going. We're going to implement policy and all this stuff. And it was like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I had these damn patients that I had to see that were keeping me from doing what I really was like just pumped about, you know, and, and not to be ungrateful for the patients, but I'm just saying my mind was in, there was a lot of things that needed to be done and patient care was really getting in the way of it. So I went down to two days. That's something just very recent for me, but it's awesome. man. I love going in there on a full day Wednesday. And I, the first time I did it, I was like, man, I'm going to sleep until like whenever I want, but I'm like, no, get your up out of bed at 7 a.m. <laughs> get there on time because this is why you're taking off the day. You, this is why you stopped doing clinical for this day. You did it to go in there and, and talk with your team, not to sit there and sleep in bed. But it's, it, I love it, man. I, I really am enjoying the managerial and the entrepreneurial uh, stuff of it. And I'm finding myself really enjoying clinical with a little less. But I mean, what are you going to do? I mean, that's just it's just, it, it, sometimes it happens. And, and there's, I've had some very ca candid conversations with some friends on, on our podcast that like, how are you going to know before dental school, how much you're going to love dentistry during dental school, after dental school, in 10 years, in 20 years, like, how are you supposed to know that until you've like worked in people's mouths for years? Right. Yeah. You, um, you know. So what would be your, what's your procedure mix right now? So right now, since I've added the second associate and I do block scheduling, so it's really focused on like this goes here, this goes here, and it's somewhat restrictive for the front desk, but there's a way to train them on it. But I've stopped doing fillings almost, well, I wouldn't say almost completely, but I think I'm almost like I've done 30 since like in 2019. So I'm not doing a lot of fillings. Wow. And my associates are taking the most majority of that. And, and, and that didn't come for me just to dump on my associates, the stuff I didn't want to do. It was more or less, hey, you've got openings in your schedule and people are really struggling just to see me. What Would you mind taking my fillings? I mean, just to fill your schedule. Yeah, yeah. And they're like, okay, I'll do that. So I slowly evolved from doing just, you know, molar endo and just everything but fillings. But now we have a periodontist oral surgeon who's now doing the majority of the implants and the extraction. And my focus has pretty much just been molar endo and orthodontics right now. Just doing, I mean, I just started, I started four cases this week on kids, you know, so it's, that's what I've been really enjoying. And I don't know if it's because I enjoy the ortho or I just enjoy the, 
not having to do much hands-on. You know, sure. it's like, it's sure. very, it's very system driven. So, right. But, um, but what I've been doing, um, I don't know what the actual number is right now, but I, I would guess it's, I mean, last year for me, ortho was about maybe 15, 20%. And I, I got to guess this year it's, it's getting up there to maybe 40% at this point. And you keep saying periodontist slash oral surgeon. Is this a person? Is this like a dual specialist or is this two okay. people? Like what's the story here? You know, what's funny is that it's, it's a funny story because I thought he was an oral surgeon when I hired him. And then I found <laughs> out that he was a periodontist. <laughs> so a little uh, bait and switch there. Yeah. You know what? So, but when I talk to patients, I say, you know, we, we got a periodontist surgeon. I don't okay. say oral surgeon because that would be, unethical I <laughs> so, does he does he do thirds yeah he does thirds he, he does on fours you know he, i think he's he's doing the same procedure mix but he's not double board certified so i probably shouldn't say periodontist oral surgeon well um, i just I, was like man he, and he's got a full-time periodontist and he's got a full-time oral surgeon i'm like man no wonder there's 25 people in there <laughs> <laughs> no, he's, he's busy man he's a gunner man he runs dude he i mean he's like we how I was at my associateship, he, he's going to do a lot of same day stuff and produce. And it, it's been all around good experience having them. And it's been, it's been so nice having, it, we did, I, I want to say in my seven year practice. Okay. I did like two or three all on four cases. And then since he's been on, we've already done five and this, wow. this is since October. And I think there's just something to be said about having somebody in house with you and just having my team present the finances and have my team present the, or provide the patient experience and do all that versus sending to them to another office where they, they, they might not even make the appointment to go. So I, right. I don't know what it is, but we're doing a whole lot more of those procedures. Um, is he full-time there or how many days there? How are you still in uh, two Fridays a month right now? So I think we could get him to every Friday at some point, but we need to probably fill our chairs a little bit more. So two Fridays is comfortable right now. Okay, cool. Um, and then in terms of like, growth overall what were like do you remember when you brought on that associate do you remember like how big yeah. your practice was collection wise like what that that decision point was for you so the last year with me solo i want to say we did 1.8 okay and when that's she, huge when she came on i want to say we did 2.3 wow when i cut down and then 2.8 the year when she went five days and then if we would have finished off this last year, like I added in so another associate in October, so I don't, I don't want to include that in the numbers, but we would have ended at three, three point three five. If we didn't add, we actually did a little bit more than that, but that's on just the two of you. Yeah, just the two of us. Yeah, three point three five. Projected to finish the year. Yeah, if we would have not expanded those last three months, because that's I, I, amazing. Like that, yeah. that blows my mind. That's phenomenal. You know what? And people ask, how did you do it? I mean, we're open um, eight o'clock till, or I'm sorry, seven to 8 p.m. You know, almost, almost four days a week. And then Fridays were there eight hours. I uh, was not there on the weekends, but a lot of it has to do with, I mean, systems and scheduling and efficiency. But I mean, part of it is just, man, we, we're just really utilizing our space as much as possible. We only had five chairs. So we, we had to split shift and we figured out a way to do it. And sometimes it was chaotic, but I, I mean, adding Saturdays and we could have added Thursday nights. We didn't have a doctor on Thursday nights back then. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, maybe we could have did 3.6. I, I don't know what the maximum <laughs> you could do out of a five chair office, but we are definitely pushing the limits on it. That's incredible. That blows my mind. Um, well, so then that leads us to this. The next phase of this is um, now that you've thoroughly Im impressed our, our listeners, which is what I wanted. <laughs> um, Tell us about your drive to start a podcast and write a book. The starting the podcast thing, I can totally relate to writing a book. Just like that gives me so much anxiety and, and hats off to you that you both wrote a book, turned it into an audio book and have this, this resource for people. But uh, I hate writing. So I'm, I'm impressed. Yeah. You know, I, I, I wasn't a big writing fan either, but what's weird is it was really fun to write the book. And uh, I started out by, I wrote like a 20 page brand book. This is what our brand's about. And I gave it to new employees. And I just said, I want to be very focused on who we are. And when every time I hire somebody, they're going to come to this great culture. And I'm going to be very uh, verbal about what this culture is. So I wrote this like 20 page brand book and I only intended for it to be two pages. And I was like, wow, that was really easy to write about something that I'm really passionate about. And I just know about. 
So it's always turned into, well, maybe I'm going to write this 40 page book on like just training your team. And then I just said, I'm going to write a book about everything I know about dentistry and practice management. And that turned out to be the 200, uh, I think it's 67, 267 page book that I wrote. And I wrote it, man. I, and I, I just tell people, I actually wrote this thing. It wasn't a ghost. It wasn't me talking to someone and they turned it into a book. It's something that I outlined and I wrote. And I wrote a rough draft and I rewrote it and I wrote a third draft. And then the editor, we came back with like four or five more drafts. That's incredible. Put a, put a lot of time into it. But it was more of a, um, when I went on to three days, it was, wow, let's do something cool with it. And the same with the podcast. After the book came out, I'm like, I'm going to do the podcast. So being three days a week, you know, I just get bored. You know, it, it's like I, I've been getting a lot more into like just multifamily real estate. And my wife's like, do you really need more on your plate? And I'm like, I'm just I just want to do things. It's like, I mean, you talk about how ADD you are. I'm like, I'm the same way. I just want to be busy. Yeah, I, I got my realtor's license in dental school and, <laughs> uh, and I wanted to get my CCIM, which is your, uh, I can't remember what the commercial something or other certification. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, multifamily and large commercial, like that's, that was always like my, my secret goal after after dentistry so yeah we, we need to have lunch or dinner sometime up in chicago <laughs> yeah, one next time sure. um because we, we don't have time to go into that today but uh that's that that blows my mind and and one question i wanted to ask was when you made this 20 page version so you, you started off with the intention of doing like a two page this is what we're all about mm-hmm. ended up with 20 pages did people did did the new hires like were they actually reading it? Like, did you, cause I, I can imagine mm-hmm. coming, showing up to some new job and there's all like the training stuff they throw at you at the beginning. How did you incorporate that so that it was an effective indoctrin- indoctrination of your culture? Right, right. So what we did or what I did, I guess, is when I hired somebody, we, we would usually reach out via email for like, Hey, we want to hire you. This is what we're going to start paying you. This is going to be the benefits. So it's all in writing and stuff like that. And then I would say, I attached, you know, our, our handbook about what it means to work in our office, read this through, see if this is for you. I promise this is not for everybody. And if this is not for you, that's totally cool, but read through it. And if it's for you, write me back and let me know. And then they would, I think they just had to read it at that point. And, and they would write back and they go, this is exactly what I'm looking for. Oh my gosh. You know, I, I, I'm so excited because it, there is an element of this book that's very, it's, it's inspirational. It's like, dude, this is not for everybody. I, expectations can be very high of you. This is going to be hard work, but it's going to be rewarding work. And it's something that you're going to love doing. And I think some part of when we're doing interviews, when we're interviewing people for a certain portion of that, when I decide I'm going to hire somebody, then I go into my sales pitch. I'm going to tell you who we are and I'm going to sell us to you because I want you to be excited coming into this culture. And part of what was been great about my, my startup is that every time we hired somebody, they came into a fantastic culture. Whereas where I used to work, it, people would come in there and be like, wow, this place is so cool. There's so many chairs. It's so busy. It's so different from my last office. And then the assistants would be like, you're going to like hate this place in two weeks. Like, <laughs> they would like literally say, you're going to hate this place. They're like, trust me, you'll be gone in six months. And, and then like, what, what does that do for the culture? You know? Yeah. So, so when people come to my practice, they're like, you're going to love it here. We're like a family. And I, I, I talked about this as voices of dentistry. And I, it's, and, and I was trying to illustrate a point that if you just communicate with your team, you, you'll have long-term uh, team members. But I, I haven't lost a single person in seven years. So now 25 employees, not a single person has left. Now we fired people. We fired two people within three weeks of them starting because we knew immediately that they were not good fits. Okay. But um, I've never, I mean, I've had issues with my team members, but we've always been able to kind of sit down and have a heart to heart and really talk about it. And I think it's so valuable as a leader to have long-term staff that's just, they're in it to win it, man. They're in it to be, they're part of that vision and they love it. And I'd say occasionally, like I think of one employee that just seemed really unhappy and I just sat down and said, hey, you just you just don't seem like you really want to work here anymore. And she, we just had an honest, she's like, well, what, what do you mean? And we just had a conversation about, you know, are you not happy here? And she's like, you know what? I'm just really not. And I'm like, well, why? What can we do? And we came up with, you know, it, what it was that she just had too much of a, a workload. Like hmm. she was doing all the insurance verifications and writing the appeals. And it was just, she wasn't given enough devoted time, uninterrupted time to do it. 
So, I mean, this conversation I had chronically behind all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And this was a conversation we had two years ago and man, she's, since we did the expansion, we got another business office and she sits in there all the time. She loves it. So I I think there's something to be said. I, yeah, people are going to leave. We we just lost somebody because she went to, she graduated nursing school, you know, that's okay, but she's not leaving on bad terms. But I think people would stick around a lot longer if us as leaders would just have some conversations with people and just check in and say, dude, how, how are things going? You know? And I think a lot of us don't. Well, um, I, I really like the way that you did this, um, especially with the fact that you email it, put the ball in their court, allow them to like digest it and they're forced to get back to you. My, my secret hope was that you would actually just slide a 20 page document across the table and like <laughs> sit there and watch them read it. <laughs> it's like, I need you to read this now. This is <laughs> no. what we're all about here. I can tell you about it, but I want you to read. I took a lot of time to write this, so I want you to read it. No, you have to be, I need you to read this and then just stop. And then be like, okay, okay. And like, no, no, go ahead. Start reading it. Read it. Yeah, right now. Um, no, I, I think, so I, I think this is, this is great because before the call, we were talking about like, I was telling you, you need to have an email list. Mm-hmm. And we were talking about like what, what we could do for an email list. If you put that 20 page document, Hey, with like there you go. A, a little guide of how to create a culture onboarding document for your practice. Wow. Um, wow. And then put that together with your original 20 page, you know, here's, here's what I did and maybe you've changed it since then. Um, yeah. I think people would find that incredibly valuable. Um, That's awesome. I got to get all like the plagiarism out of there then. If I'm <laughs> right. <laughs> all of the stuff you stole from, from <laughs> other authors, other, other dentists. Perfect. I'm just kidding. That's a great idea. I love that. Um, cause, cause I think people, uh, this is a very practical, implementable part of transferring that culture to new people. And the, the best part is that because you put it to paper, it's now a system yeah. that you don't have to spend time on, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think that's really cool. We're going to do a whole season on leadership and this idea of like how to be a good leader is like such a nebulous almost like can feel like a BS question of like, Mm -hmm. am I a good leader or how do I become a better leader? Everyone thinks they're a good leader. Um, And at the end of the day, some people are not and some people are. Um, And and so I want your input of if you could design a season of a podcast on leadership, what would be the major components or the major like headings that you'd Mm want to hit? Um, and then specifically, what are some things that you do or that you've seen um, that are, are skills that can be developed rather than just like, oh, be a good person? You know, like that's a very nebulous thing, which you have to do to be a good leader, but it's not right. really helpful to hear that on a podcast. So does yeah. that make sense? I'm, I'm asking a lot of you right now. I'm, yeah, you know, yeah. I think Design, I think design my good. podcast on air. Go. <laughs> so, you know, I think, I mean, you're, it, you're right. It, it's being a good person. It, it all comes down to just be... A good person. <laughs> care about people, do the right thing, integrity, things like that. Yeah. But, but I think, you know, foundationally, the, one of the biggest things is that extreme ownership idea is that, you know, the wins is the wins are for the team and the losses are my fault. Everything is my fault. And so many blaming dentists. I mean, I was talking to this one guy and he's talking about how, you know, it's total bull, the insurance, you know, I, I got to catch up in retirement. I'm working six days a week and, you know, everyone, there's, there's just no patients in my area. And I'm like, well, nobody in your area is doing good. And he's like, no, everyone's doing bad. Like, okay. Yeah. Or whatever. That's, that's really empowering. But, uh, yeah, it's just like own it, man, own everything. And I talked about this at voices a little bit is I kind of talked about it. I, we just tend to train our teams to not communicate because ultimately at the, at the, the foundation of leadership is about communication. It's about communication and relationships with your team. And I guess also about setting expectations. And we kind of talked about that with the brand book, but it's, it's communicating, just talking to them. A word from our sponsor. Surprisingly, Zen Supplies is not a supply company. So what is it and why do I need it? Zen Supplies solves a problem that you absolutely have in your dental office right now. You have this problem, you. Your entire supply management system is one person. Let's call her Karen. So Karen is trying to do her best to stay on budget, if you even have a budget. She's trying to keep track of all these logins and all the websites, trying to shop around, make sure that everything's stocked, but you have not given Karen the tools to succeed. 
So what Zen Supplies does is it centralizes every single supplier that you're connected to via rep, via buying group, whatever it is you already have in place, it will take all of that and put it onto one platform. Not only does that turn searching into a one-stop shop, it also will automatically let you know, hey, you could be getting this cheaper here or here. In addition, Zen Supplies will give you the ability to track your inventory so that with the single click of the button, you can restock with exactly what you're gonna need for the next two weeks. You can turn what used to be a multi-hour project every single week into less than 20 minutes to get your office restocked and ready to go. When you're finally ready to start saving money on your supplies, go to zensupplies.com SP to get $200 off your first year's subscription. Click the button to request a demo today. Zen Supplies, let's get organized. This has all been really good. How do you build a system out of communication? Uh -huh. where, where does this get dropped when it's done poorly? And what does it look like when it's done well? Okay, so I would say a system for communicating is, and I, and I, I talked about this at Voices as well. I said that if you take one thing out of what I'm saying, it's going to just change your practice, and it will, and it's so easy, is just take, take your team members one by one in your office and just have a real conversation about like, hey, how are things going here? Do you like your job anymore? Is there anything I can do to, to, to make your job better? You know, can you give me some feedback as a leader? Is, is there anything that I'm doing? How am I doing for you? What can we work on if the front desk? What can we work at the front desk? What's going well? What's not going well? And just get some input and just give them an opportunity to tell you if anything's going on or if, yeah, I remember one time talking to my insurance coordinator, she's telling me about uh, just that the way they verify insurance is it's really hard because they're doing it at the front desk in between phone calls, in between all this. And I'm, there's like, it's just burning everybody out. And I'm like, huh, well, how long has it been like this? And she's like, wow. Ah probably ever since we started hmm. <laughs> just like, well, why have you never said anything? She's like, I don't know. I just never thought to bring it up. So th these are the kind of things that you, you get, you get this feedback from people, but where it gets screwed up is when we, we get pissed off at our team members. We start blaming them for stuff that maybe it is their fault, but it shouldn't be their fault. And we blame them for not having the room set up. You know, you know what? what why can't you just set this room up right? I tell you over and over again, what are you, stupid or something? And, and this is what we do to people instead of saying, you know what, do I need to create, like, do I need to talk about creating a checklist with you? Or do, is there something we can do? Is there a system we can create so that we're, we're more efficient for, for the, for so it's better for the patients? You know, always relating it back to why is it good? Why, why is it important that we do this way? And it's always because of the patients, you know, it's because of efficiency for the patients. They have shorter appointments. But Looking at it from that lens rather than, oh, I just can't find good people anymore. I can't find good people. And we create this environment where our, our team is scared to screw up because when they screw up, we make them feel like crap about it. And I think that's just the total wrong way. You got to say, hey, somebody screwed up. Something happened. And let's, 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 let's talk about it. Let's move on. And I, and I say one of the mantras at my practice is grace over guilt. Like, I want you to tell me you really screwed something up. And my team will tell me they've really dropped the ball on people. And that's cool. And I'm like, oh, it sucks. Okay, well, what, what, do we, what can we do this, this never happens again? And I want them to be comfortable talking to me about that stuff because that's what's going to help us to get better. It's going to help us work together as a team and come up with new systems and stuff. But if they're so scared you know, to, uh, to do, to tell me about it, we're not going to do anything. Like, I don't want to have the type of practice where when I'm there, people are working harder. Right. Because I'm there and they don't, they don't want me to yell at them because they're scared of me. I mean, that's, that's, that's bull, man. I, they shouldn't be scared of me. They should be happy that I'm there. And I, I feel like they are, I hope they are, but I guess I really don't know when I'm not there, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, but cameras, it's, yeah, it's about just, uh, I'd hate to come back to being a good person, but just communicating just like a relationship with your wife you gotta you set expectations and you say how are things going and you take your failures and turn them into wins um i feel like you this is uh, you you called it something like a safe space or something yeah um, psychological safety so i called it a, i call it a safe place so i, okay. I was really in bod i was relating it to the movie a quiet place how which, the only way that they could stay safe is to be quiet, which conversely, if you don't want to look stupid in a meeting, if you don't want to look like you don't know what you're doing or you don't want to like look incompetent, you just, you just stay quiet and you just don't say anything. And, and I'll just add a little caveat that is uh, podcast number 40 
one on my on my skills. <laughs> Is my B- BOD no, this is this is great, and and I I do have to mention that uh, a quiet place was my favorite movie of 2018, and nice. I have a, a, a Hollywood crush on John Krasinski and Emily Blunt as my favorite Hollywood couple. Um, I, I've never bought a People magazine in my life, but if if they were on the cover, I would think about it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I I love this concept of psychological safety and and just owning up to everything, baking into your, the way you do things, just bringing people into a room and, and saying, Hey, where are we at with these things? And, and allowing by, by taking all of the blame on yourself. Um, and, and that grace, what you said, grace over grace over guilt, grace over guilt. And so that means to you, grace over guilt means like forgiveness over feeling bad about things. Well, fe- fe- feeling, uh, giving forgiveness instead of blaming. Okay. Okay. So uh, you've built a culture of, of that safety. Um, how, how long ago did you realize that? Was that in your original 20 page thing? It wasn't. And this was something that I saw a Ted talk maybe about two and a half years ago about it. I'm like, Oh dude, that's what I do. That's, that's totally, it, it just kind of, it verbalized. That's kind of what I've been doing. So it's, for me, it's always been kind of a thing. And I think almost parenting has helped with it because <laughs> I've got an eight-year-old daughter and I always want to be like, so you got a cute boy. So you got a crush on this boy. Like, like you know, just get razz her a little bit. Like she'll talk about boys. And I'm like, wait, well, you know what? If I keep behaving that way with her, she's not going to tell me about She's going to close off. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, she just, <laughs> she'll tell me things. About this, like, there's this guy, there's this boy, Braden, that's like got a crush on him. He's like, he, he keeps hugging me, and I tell him to stop, but he hugs me. And I'm just like, you better tell this I'm effort to stop hugging you, or I'm gonna kick his ass. But, uh, <laughs> but I have to sit there and I'd be like, oh, yeah, okay, well, that, that's cute that he likes you, you know. And I'm sitting there and I'm just like, just, just react right, you know, because right. I want her to, and so like little situations like that has made me realize that, uh, the way that I'm reacting at work sometimes wasn't working. And I had to learn that the hard way. I mean, I, not that I've ever thrown an instrument, but I've, I've kicked my assistant Lauren a few times, like just under the chair, like, Hey, what, <laughs> like, what are you doing? And uh, so, it, but you learn that that's not a good way to lead. And um, I started off as this is my way is my practice. no, my name's on the door. I'm the boss. And that's just a dumb way to lead. You got to be one of everybody. You can't lead with your title. You got you to just be a, be a people person and you're not above anybody. And that I'm not getting to the practice as early as everybody else. And sometimes I leave before they're done cleaning up, but I will pick up a broom and I will brush the toilet. So I, I'm not above anything, but you know, it, it's just about, if you come back to just be a good person. So what other ways has your kind of definition and understanding of leadership changed over the past eight years in this practice? Yeah, I'd say for me, it's, it's, it's slowly been evolution of me leading more. And because I, like I said, when I went to three days, I wasn't doing any leadership at all. I mean, I wasn't doing focused time leadership. And I've kind of just realized, especially this year recently, is that I need to continue to do the things that I'm great at and that nobody else can do. And at my practice, that's just injecting culture. That's uh, helping facilitate discussion, work on systems. And I've managed to delegate, you know, almost everything I do. Like I don't write my own notes. I don't write, I do write some lab slips, but I don't do a whole lot of them. I, um, I probably numb half of my patients. I the hygienists do it. And, I'm just focusing really on, on dentistry and now just more of a focus on uh, the management. And that's what is most powerful for me. I know that's where I add the most value at the practice and that's what I want to spend the most time doing. But that involved me establishing leaders on my practice and or in my practice. And that took a lot of um, changing the way I responded to when people brought me things. I mean, there was a there was a point in my practice where I was just constantly putting out fires all day, and I'm like, well, I could do some dentistry if you girls will leave me alone, you know. Mm. So it, it it started by I I read Chuck Blakeman's book, How Money Is Killing Your Business or Making Money Is Killing Your Business, and then I met him in Dallas at his Got Summit, and I came back with just a whole new just mindset, and I said, I'm just gonna give them things to do, 
and I'm just going to let them do it. I'm not going to tell them how to do it. So I started just delegating and they were like, okay, do you want me to do it? I'm like, I, I don't care how you do it. Just do it. And it was almost uh, abdicating. Like I was just d- delegating by abdication, just like, here, go do it. I don't care. It's not my problem anymore. Right. But, um, but yeah, I started like when people would ask me like, hey, this happened, what should I do? And I'd be like, what do you think you should do? Right. I, I don't know. That's why I'm asking Figure you. I'm like, yeah. well, what do you think I would do? And they're like, well, I would do this. And I'm like, they're like, is that what you would do? I'm like, I don't know. But why don't you try it? And we'll see how it goes. And eventually it got to the point that people stopped asking me they questions. Stopped asking. <laughs> and uh, I, I'll tell you, it's like I, I wanted to be left alone. And I took two weeks off in September. And they didn't need me. <laughs> and, yeah. and I'm sitting at home and I'm like, would somebody call me and like tell me what's going on at the practice? Like I'm, I'm getting antsy. Like why is nobody calling me to like to do anything? Why don't you guys need me anymore? And it's, it's funny. Like we, we, we had team lead, we have team lead meetings and I, I didn't go to the first one, you know, because I just, I couldn't do it the time that they could do it. And they're like, Hey, uh, we know we scheduled this for three, but we have time now. Do you care if we do it? And I'm like, well, no, go ahead. Just do it with the leads. And Man, I, I, it's it's amazing how much I don't need to be there for the day to day anymore. But my job is to create the culture and and create the growth and, and work out aspects of that. And that's what I'm good at. And that's what I enjoy. So um, I, th- I think that's a big part of the leadership is the delegating. Got to delegate. Get that crap off your plate. Stop stop writing your clinical notes. Stop doing um, man. The dentist. Stop doing your temporaries. I, I don't know. Just stop to, if you can delegate it, get rid of it. That's what I say. Yeah. I, I love that. And, and I love that. Um, one of the things you mentioned in the book too, was creating that time and that space to be a leader when you're not chair side. And it sounds like yeah. that's strategically been something you've done over and over in your practice is as you switch to fewer and fewer days, it's not just to disappear, but it's to focus on these things and build these systems and be the leader and, and have the time and space to really focus on that. Yeah, you got to too, man. And, and you, you, I've noticed from my practice and, and like having like Derek Williams on, uh, Justin Short, uh, I'm trying to think of some other, Jason Tenuri is two day, Derek and, uh, well, Justin's not doing anymore, but Derek was doing three days, is that the people that are having like really successful practices, they're not doing four or five days of clinical anymore. They're, they're, because and not that you can't have a successful practice, but I think it's from running it like a business, you need to have that dedicated time where you can just, work on the business, you know, work on the systems, like say, where are we going? How are we doing? And what are we going to do next? So uh, it's super important. The culture piece of things, I I think you've given uh, a taste of how you, you've structured it, how, you know, the, the letter that you wrote and had everyone read. Is there any other like advice you'd give for getting your team to buy into that culture? Um, well, I, 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 we just did a quarterly meeting recently and we, we reestablished our core values. So I, as much as people hate the mission statement and the vision statement, I think you need to revisit that and you need to constantly talk about that, who you are. I think it's important to know who you are and, and what you do. And, and so that, I mean, they have to buy into it. But I, the thing is, is I, they will buy into it if your cause is noble, you know, if, if your whole thing is like, hey, we got to have production our goals because I just bought this other lake house hmm. and I didn't want the big boat, but I figured if we got a production up, we could afford the boat. Like I can afford it. You know, nobody's going to get behind that. But if, if it's about the patients, and that's something I always stress with my team, these dollar values, they're not about production. It's about how much value can we create in a short period of time. You know, That's what the, the production goals are about. And it's not about money, even though it is money. But um, it's just... So Getting them, go ahead. Yeah. How did you, how did you actually do this? So you you know before you had your core values, you had your mission statement. Like, take me, put me as a fly on the wall on your most recent kind of restructuring of all of this. Um, like, what was your process? What did you tell your team? Like, hey, let's let's revisit this. Let's read over what we had before. What do you yeah. guys think? What would you change? Like, how did you actually go about reestablishing your core, core values and culture? Yeah. So I just said, I said, you know what, you know, we added a lot of people and it's, it's really cool. We had, we had this meeting space at, at a country club that I'm a member of and it's a really cool meeting space, but we had, uh, I just had time. I said, Hey, you know, we added a little people and I think it's important that we just go back and revisit who we are. So pretty much said, Hey, we did this core value exercise. We did it, I think two years ago. Let's do it again. 
you know, and, and so what we did this time is we just sat down and I said, what are our core values? Somebody say something out. And they say, uh, quality. And I'm like, okay, well, what does that mean to you? And what does that mean to us? And we did it as a team and we came up with everything again. We came up like six things. I haven't typed it out in a document yet. But it was good to start with the core values because that's the easiest thing for to articulate. Um, the mission statement is, you know, what's your goal? What is your purpose? And then the vision statement is, if we achieve our mission, what is the outcome? So those are things that are a little bit harder to pinpoint. Mm. But we just, I mean, we redid our vision statement. I just released a podcast about it. Is that um, the Cal Newport, uh, so good that, so good that. So good they can't ignore you. So I they, love yeah. that book. I Great. love that book. Yeah, so we we decided that that <clears throat> that that's going to be our our vision. You know, we're just going to be so freaking good that you know they're going to write five stars reviews about us. They're going to be telling their friends about us, and, and that's kind of how we've been. Um, I like vocalizing that, and I think people don't think that's important. And I would say if you never did that, you're not going to fail. But it just means so much more just to be clear on what you are, because a lot of the issues that we have interpersonally with people just come down to a failure to meet someone's unvocalized expectations, you know, Mm -hmm. and this is the expectation. This is what I want. And and then we went through my, um, and this is part of, it's in my book is the psychology of waiting. And this kind of comes down to what do we do when people come into our practice? What do we do? What is our script? What do we do? Do we seat people on time, even if we're not ready for them? Well, yeah, we do because people don't like to wait. They want to start on time. If we're running behind, I want someone going in that waiting room and I want you to say, Hey, Mrs. Jones, we know you're here. We're running about 10 minutes behind. We'll get you back as soon as we can. Mm. Because, I, because I don't want them sitting there going, should I get up and like, let them know I'm here? Do they know I'm here? Do they forget about me? I yeah. don't want that anxiety. So I, I actually had someone from a local uh, speech pathologist. I, I don't, I don't know what they're called. They, they do speech for kids and she's a patient and she says, you know, how, how did you get everyone to be so nice there? And I had lunch with her and I said, I don't just, you just don't realize how scripted everything is. Not that it's scripted, but how much we've nailed down the patient experience, every little step, words that we use, the way we communicate ideas, the way we touch you on the shoulder, the way that we, we always end on something like it's so good to see you and a touch on the shoulder and just every little thing that happens. When you walk in my practice, we will show you where the water is. Um, we'll show you where the bathroom is. We do that. Every time I sit a patient up when I'm, I'm going to let their stare at the crown, I ask them, Hey, can I get you water or coffee? And they're just like, Whoa, I can't believe the doctor is like offering me that. Hmm. They never say it. They never want it. Maybe one out of 10 times, maybe one out of 20 times they'll say it and I'll have my assistant go get water or coffee. But um, just the little things like that and let them know, like, call me on the weekend. I have my home phone numbers on my business card. Nobody ever calls, but, right. but they want it. It's just li- all these little things adding up and, and it just becomes embedded that this is who we are and this is the experience we provide and there's just something to be said when everyone on your team is telling all their family and friends, you got to come here. We're awesome. You know? Yeah, no. And, and they just wholeheartedly believe that this is the best place that anyone could ever go to the dentist. Yeah, true. Um, well, th- this has been a lot of fun. I'm pretty sure we're over time, but because it was so much fun, it only feels like it was 30 minutes. Yeah. yeah um, it was quick. And, and, this was great. I, I really have enjoyed your book so far. I've enjoyed your podcast. Um, if people want to reach out to you, like how, how available are you making yourself to, to people who are listening to your show or that have questions? Yeah. You know, people reach out to me on Facebook messenger all the time and I'm totally cool doing that. Uh, I do get back to everybody. It doesn't happen right away all the time. Cause I'm, it, as the podcast has grown and it, it's, I want to be available for people and I love helping people, but there's just only so many hours in the day. And sometimes I'll do an hour call with somebody and I'm not charging anything. And I look at the day and I said, wow, there was so many more important things I should have done beside that. Hmm. But I'm always happy to, you know, you know, shoot me a Facebook message. I, I, I'm, I'm happy. And I, I had one guy I called and he said, man, I'm, I'm just I'm blown away that you never forgot about me. I mean, it took me like two months to get back to him um, to set up a call, but I, you know, I, I always do get back to people. I love helping other dentists. I think it, being successful in dentistry and practice management is something that anybody can do. You don't have to be charismatic. You don't have, you have to be uh, an amazing, I mean, you really don't have to be a very good clinician at all, to be honest, but um, <laughs> don't tell people that. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 that's the freaking truth. But, um, you know, anybody can do it. It's, it's not this anything that you can't learn, um, but it all comes down to that leadership stuff. And 
I think we focus a lot on clinical and the communication element is so much less sexy, but it's so much more important. So um, kind of getting on a tangent here, but yeah, uh, reach out to me, uh, find me uh, dental practice heroes on Facebook or just Paula, just in my name, find me on Facebook, um, just shoot me a message, or you can hit me up at dental practice heroes at gmail.com. And, and your book is on Amazon. We've got it physical. We've got Kindle. We've got the audiobook. And then um, what, what I really want our listeners to do is just shoot Paul a message saying, hey, I would totally love to be part of your email list if you had a little giveaway with your 20-page document and how to make my own. Uh, just give them a little like kick in the pants of like, this is a, I love your idea. Let's, let's run with it. So yeah, that's awesome. And I'll get that together and I will be happy to share that with anybody who shoots me an email at dental practice heroes at Gmail. Sounds you're great. like, you're like you jerk. I haven't built this. And now people are going <laughs> to, no, I'm already going, I'm going into my pitch already. You know, are, <laughs> you, are you ready to revolutionize your practice? <laughs> I Just love it. hit the send button. <laughs> oh, this was so much fun. I, we're, we're definitely going to meet up in person and yeah. uh, I, I've already learned a ton from you. So thank you so much for, for coming on our show. Yeah, sweet, man. Happy to be on and thanks for having me. It was, it was cool. Awesome. Well, we will talk with you guys next time. Okay, hopefully you guys understand now why I wanted to save this interview uh, with Dr. Etchison. And, and the things that I loved, I loved so much the, the thought and the intent that he puts into being a leader and a practice owner. And, and he gives it time. And he literally takes chairside time away to, to work on that and puts his thoughts to paper and shares his core values. And when there's creates core values with the team and when there's more team members, make sure that they're in on the process. I loved his um, kind of onboarding of team members via this, this culture handbook and how that's right up front. They understand exactly what they're getting themselves into. And sometimes it, it, it takes growing one person at a time to build this entire culture, but it's an intentional thing and it has to happen both hiring and ongoing training and re-emphasis. Um, so anyways, he, he said it way better than I'm saying it right now. But go to dentalpracticeheroes.com. He's got the, the book. He's got his um, podcast. He's got lectures. He, he's got a lot, of, a lot of stuff on there. So really, uh, please reach out to Paul if you enjoyed this and let him know that uh, you finally heard him on the, the Shared Practices podcast. But uh, I think we might have to try and get him back for an update because now it's been um, coming up in a, in a month or two here. It's been a year since we recorded this. And I would love to hear what's changed, what he's learned, um, and what he's doing. So thank you guys for sticking around. Thank you guys. Also, I, I was checking our reviews on, um, on on the Apple Store, and I apologize. I know that um, there are just as many, or if not more, Samsung Android users than, and I even said I said Samsung is Android users um, than Apple users. But unfortunately, Apple tends to be the place where podcasts are housed and live, and the ratings are aggregated there better than a lot of other platforms. So thank you so much for everyone who has left us a review. We're now over 360 reviews. We're getting close to 370, which just, it means the world to us. It means a lot that we've provided value to you and that you've taken the time to log, find your Apple login, log in, leave us a review. Um, it goes a long way. So thank you guys. And we will talk with you next week on the Shared Practices podcast. I'm excited to announce a partnership with Sandy Pardue. We are rebooting the Dental Drill Bits podcast. Sandy and I sat down and said, what if we did a podcast together? What if we did a whole season of, of your show together? And it works out perfectly because I have a ton of questions and she has a ton of answers. So we combined my skill at asking questions but not necessarily knowing the answer and her skill at answering every single question with a wealth of knowledge specific examples and experience. If you want to get your dental practice organized, if you have trouble with understanding the roles and the functions and the systems of your office, join us every Tuesday on the Dental Drill Bits podcast.